Good morning and warm welcome to online anesthesia postgraduate teaching program on Zoom platform. It is sponsored by Akrilla and hosted by Avon Logics. Today we have a legendary teacher, Ram Kumar Vengadeswaran sir among us to deliver a lecture on airway assessment and algorithm based airway management. He needs no introduction. For completion's sake, I like to introduce him. He has completed his MBBS in MD from Jibmar and joined KMC Manipal in 1985. He has 32 years of teaching experience at KMC Manipal. He is among the board of trustee of Mission Smile and director of Medical Stimulation Center from 2009 to 2013. He is the founder chairman of All India Difficult Airway Association from 2010. And he is now editor in chief of Airway since inception in 2018. It is a publication of the All India Difficult Airway Association. I will be, we welcome you, sir. We are immensely pleased to have you in our platform. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Edwin. And uh, it's the, uh, the... Do I have to share the screen again? Yeah. Yeah. Is that okay, uh, Dr. Johnson? Yeah, yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's clear. Great. So, once again, uh, just before we, we started the actual program, I had an opportunity to just talk to Dr. Johnson and uh, some of the other organizers like Rajesh and Sil Prasad. And I said that this is a, a great initiative taken by Online Anesthesia and I'm very happy to be a, a part of this, of this program. Now, the topic that has been chosen for the day is extremely important for two reasons. One is, uh, I think, uh, uh, as the topic says, airway assessment and algorithm-based airway management Airway assessment is very much a part of uh, clinical assessment of patients. And uh, as anesthesiologists, I don't need to emphasize the reasons why a very uh, in-depth uh, assessment of the airway is essential towards the conduct of a safe anesthesia. So I will talk a little bit about the airway assessment, what are the various parameters we look for, and try to give you the reasons why we are looking for those uh, parameters during our airway assessment. And uh, in the last part of the lecture, the second part, I will go on to just the generics of algorithm-based airway management. So with this uh, introduction, uh, let me straight away go on to the topic. Now, uh, why should we assess the airway? Uh, this is a very uh, basic question. I don't think anybody will uh, have any objection to this question. But yet, I need to say that all postgraduates, the first thing that they are taught is a clinical examination by the bedside. Uh, we, are, uh, we are, after all, the, uh, the physicians of the operation theater, but we are also primarily the airway managers for the entire hospital, so to say, in addition to the, uh, the respiratory medicine people, the respiratory therapists, and the emergency medicine people. So we uh, constitute a group of uh, physicians uh, and professionals who need to concentrate on the assessment of the airway because most of the general anesthetics, we need to administer anesthesia through the airway and that becomes an important problem. Now, it also, by assessing the airway, we also create a zone of comfort for ourselves rather than our having to navigate through uncharted territories. And I just like to put up this GPS icon here for the time being because nowadays, nobody believes any signs. I remember earlier in Pondicherry or anywhere in Tamil Nadu, you say, how do I get to such and such a place? They say, sir, straight up, right up, dead end, left and so on. 
that is the way you reach your destination but nowadays i think we all need to have a much more detailed uh, approach to our destination and in this topic for the topic for the day our destination is securing a definitive safe airway and for this the gps that we use the first step of gps that we use is airway assessment now there are three major components of airway assessment when we assess the airway what are we trying to find out what are we trying to establish we try to find out whether there are any anatomical factors that will come in the way of our achieving a definitive airway be it an endotracheal tube be it a supraglottic airway device be it even face mask ventilation or the eventual uh, emergency cricothyrotomy we look for all these anatomical evidences when we examine a patient to try and identify whether this patient is going to pose a problem to us in any of these types of airway management so anatomical difficulty is one of the reasons or one of the components of airway assessment the second component is physiological difficulty when we talk about a difficult airway majority of us will concentrate on the anatomical difficulty but we must remember that there are two other areas that can pose a lot of difficulty and one of them is the physiological difficulty which we'll talk about a little later which is nothing but physiological reasons that pose a hindrance to your uh, achieving a safe and successful airway and finally the contextual difficulties which we'll talk about in a little more detail so these are the three major components of airway assessment anatomical to assess or evaluate or identify anatomical difficulty physiological difficulty and contextual difficulty now what is anatomically difficult airway it is common sense but yet i will define it for you anatomically difficult airway exists when the pre operative airway examination reveals anatomical factors that could pose a hindrance usually a mechanical hindrance either for placing a definitive airway such as an endotracheal tube or a supraglottic airway or may pose a difficulty for oxygenation prior to securing a definitive airway like for instance face mask ventilation so it could be any of the aspects of airway management and if there is an anatomical difficulty posed we need to identify that as far as physiologically difficult airway is concerned we look at two categories of patients and this is primarily we look at patients who come very sick to us in the operation theater or patients in the intensive care unit who have been on a ventilator for some time they need a you know a readjustment of their or they need an intubation for the first time so in the icu these patients are quite physiologically unstable so the two bullet points draw our attention to one a coexisting medical condition that compromises oxygenation in the resting state it could be a respiratory problem it could be a cardiovascular problem so if there is already a resting hypoxemia whatever we do during our process of airway management may add to the problems so this is uh, one of the angles that we need to look at the second bullet point draws our attention to a, a, an altered hemodynamics which can also result in uh, uh, airway difficulties or a physiologically difficult airway now much of these things have been described very in very detailed manner in several algorithms but for the benefit of our indian uh, audience i have put one of the guidelines that we have brought out from the all india difficult airway association in the indian journal of anesthesia 2016 with the reference at the bottom the contextually difficult airway is now a total a third angle to it anatomically difficult we can understand there is a hindrance to the passage of a, a device to secure a definitive airway physiological there is a problem with oxygenation or blood pressure finally you come to the contextually difficult airway which depends as the as the name signifies it depends on the context if there is a non availability of appropriate airway equipment you can you can't blame the airway manager for not managing the airway optimally similarly you may have appropriate airway equipment but the anesthesiologist is not familiar with the use of such equipment this can also lead to a problem and what i want to say here is if you have Uh, you know a, a device that is appropriate for the situation but you are not experienced enough to use it this can still add to our difficulties in managing the airway so anatomically difficult airway physiologically difficult airway and contextually difficult airway another thing that we need to evaluate during our history or uh, you know uh, a detailed history uh, taking of our patient is a history of previous difficult airway always very strongly predicts the possibility 
of a difficult AVM future as well. So if the patient says that they were anesthetized, that he or she was anesthetized in some other location, they had to back off because of some problem, it would be a good idea for us to talk to that anesthetist to find out what ex exactly the problem was. Was it an anatomical problem, in which case it wouldn't have changed? Was it a physiological problem? Again, it wouldn't have changed. But if it was a contextual problem, yes, maybe in our center, we may be better equipped to deal with that situation. So for all this, when one, one, any one of us comes across a difficult airway, one needs to give what is called an alert, a difficult airway alert. Abroad, they have a medic alert band. But in India, the Difficult Airway Association has once again, the All India Difficult Airway Association, has devised a reporting, uh, uh, what should I say, a reporting format for anesthesiologists to, re to report when there's been a difficult airway. So look for a detail, look in a detailed history for a history of previous difficult airway and do a focused airway history and a review of anesthetic records to evaluate what the problem was so that we can be better equipped on this occasion. Now, difficulty in airway management can arise from one of these five uh, areas of airway management. It can be difficulty in face pass ventilation, difficulty in performing direct laryngoscopy, difficulty in video laryngoscopy, difficulty in placing a supraglottic airway device, and difficulty in emergency cricothyrotomy. And all of this is very beautifully described in a textbook by Tim Cook and Christensen. The chapter is, is titled Structured Planning of Airway Management uh, uh, by Law and Heidegger. The core topics in airway management is a 2021 edition of this particular uh, uh, textbook. And I have summarized in the next five slides the five bullet points that we need to concentrate on. So let's first look at what are the factors that lead to a difficult face mask ventilation? Now, in this slide and the next four slides, you'll find a series, a list of factors that will contribute, anatomical factors that will contribute to difficulty in airway management. All of this is available in the textbooks. So I will just highlight some of the important ones. Now, presence of a full beard in the male gender who's edentulous over the age of 50 years and having a body mass index that is more than 26 kilograms per meter squared was beautifully summarized by Langeron et al. in the year 2000 as five of the factors that add on to difficult face pass ventilation. To this, we can say modified malampati class three or four, history of snoring, neck radiation, and the limited mandibular protrusion. All of these we need to look for when we do an airway evaluation. Now, what are the factors that will, anatomical factors that will hinder direct laryngoscopy? I know that to perform a direct laryngoscopy, you need to have adequate mouth opening, enough space for you to introduce the blade of the laryngoscope. So listed for you here on the slide are several factors like limited mouth opening, a narrow dental arch, adverse dentition, meaning either loss of teeth or very loose teeth, limited mandibular protrusion, the ability to protrude your mandible into a prognathic state, short thyromental distance, modified malampati class 3 and 4 makes it appearance again, limited head and neck, upper neck extension, and increased neck circumference in obese individuals. All of these contribute to a difficult anatomical factor for a direct laryngoscopy. Now, in the last maybe 20 or 25 years, we've been accustomed in many centers to the use of a video laryngoscope. And the video laryngoscope, no doubt, makes a difficult airway easier to manage. However, there are certain red flags that need to be looked for even to perform a video laryngoscopy. Once again, you need adequate mouth opening to introduce a laryngoscope. Blood or gastric contents in the upper airway can come in the way of viewing the larynx, which is an additional problem of a video laryngoscope. If it's a direct laryngoscope, you can perform a suction and you'll see the larynx immediately. But the video laryngoscope has this drawback. Again, limited mandibular protrusion, short pyramidal distance, a poor cormac hand grading on a previous anesthetic during direct laryngoscopy, history of neck radiation, limited neck mobility, and inexperience with video laryngoscopy. This is what I mentioned. It's a contextual factor. A video laryngoscope may be available, but I am not trained to use it, and therefore I should not be attempting to use it because I'm not going to be successful. So you need to be familiar with the difficult airway equipment, and that is the inexperience with a particular equipment leads to contextual difficulties. Difficult supraglottic airway insertion, once again, you need a space to introduce at least two to 2.5 centimeters inter-incisor distance or inter-gingival distance is required 
for us to introduce a bulky supraglottic airway device. So a limited mouth opening, uh, pathology in the, uh, in the oral uh, uh, structures can give, uh, give rise to a problem. Uh, fixed neck fle uh, flexion deformity of the neck uh, improperly applied or excessively applied cricoid force can distort the anatomical structures and a BMI, a body mass index of more than 29 kilograms per meter square. Finally, I come to the most, uh, you know, uh, possibly none of, none of us want to face the situation, uh, emergency cricotherotomy, because this is the last saving step in airway management. And there are several factors that also pose a problem to emergency cricotherotomy. And these include a female gender, age, the pediatric age group less than eight years, thick neck like in obesity, a displaced trachea due to a tumor in the neck, overlying neck pathology, fixed neck flexion and neck radiation. So we have now summarized what are the various factors that we need to look for that will tell us a difficulty in face mask ventilation, difficulty in direct laryngoscopy, difficulty in video laryngoscopy, difficulty in placement of a supraglottic AV device, and the final step, difficulty in an emergency cricotherotomy. Well, let's go to some of the other things that we need to look at during AV examination. Now, it's almost 100 years ago that Professor Megill suggested that sniffing the morning air position for laryngoscopy was ideal. There are various protagonists and antagonists to this view. However, by and large, even now, most of us teach postgraduates that sniffing the morning air position is the ideal position for laryngoscopy. Well, now, what does this position do? It has two components. It has a component of cervical flexion, which is the lower cervical spine, and extension at the atlanto-occipital joint. So these two movements that are that compose the sniffing position bring three axes into alignment. And I'm not going to go any more into this because this is a, a point that is, uh, you know, people have a pro-con session on whether sniffing position is ideal or not. But I think by and large, sniffing position does help us in the management of the airway, particularly the difficult airway. Mouth opening, I don't need to emphasize that we need adequate mouth opening to pass an instrument into the uh, oral cavity, through the oropharynx, laryngopharynx into the trachea. So it may be a, a direct laryngoscope, it may be a video laryngoscope, it may be a supraglottic airway device. It doesn't matter. It is important for us to assess the mouth opening. And this is assessed uh, for, we assess for movement of the, at the temporomandibular joint. And we always teach that we place one finger in front of the tragus and open the mouth. So this hinge-like movement, by opening the mouth, you feel your finger dipping into the joint of the temporomandibular space. And that is assessing the hinge-like movement of the temporomandibular joint. And the gliding motion is assessed in a slightly different way. So the hinge movement is assessed by the ability to insinuate one finger in front of the tragus while the patient opens the mouth. The adequacy of mouth opening is further assessed by the ability to place two fingers or approximately three centimeters between the two incisors or the inter incisor distance or the inter gingival distance of two, at least two finger breadths approximately, which will give us three centimeters, tells us that we are in the right track. So one finger in the temporomandibular joint, two fingers in the inter incisor space. And the final thing is looking for the translational movement of the temporomandibular joint, which essentially looks at our ability to move our mandible ahead of the maxilla. So when you look at a side-on view, the mandible will be ahead of the maxilla. And this is what's called a prognathic attitude. And this was uh, very nicely described by a simple test called the upper lip bite test, where if you're able to bite beyond your upper lip, then everything is fine. So we have a, a system of grading the upper lip bite test as well. I leave you to go through the original literature in order to find that out for yourself for lack of time. So the third thing that we need to concentrate on is the size of the tongue. Now we know that the tongue occupies the mouth and the oropharynx, and the base of the tongue lies very close to the glottic inlet. And that is the reason why the tongue is an anatomical, uh, one of the anatomical structures that often uh, causes problems for us during intubation. Now during laryngoscopy, what we actually do is we displace the tongue. We displace the tongue anteriorly into a space that is called a submandibular space or the mandibular space. So this is the soft tissue space that is enclosed by the margin of the mandible. And my finger is pointing to that particular space. 
So what we're trying to find out is two things. Is the tongue large or is the submandibular space small? So you can have a normal situation when you have a normal tongue and a normal submandibular space volume. However, suppose you have a large tongue with a normal submandibular space, then you cannot displace the tongue into the submandibular area during laryngoscopy. And if you have a normal sized tongue with a narrow or a small submandibular space, again, you have a problem to displace the tongue. So discrepancy between the size of the tongue and the submandibular space is evaluated by what is, <coughs> what is called the Malampati classification. And essentially, this has been modified. We look at four anatomical structures, the soft palate, the uvula, the fossil fossils and the pillars. And we can just abbreviate this as the first letter of each of these anatomical structures, S, U, F and P. And this is what we look for in the Malampati, modified Malampati classification. Class one through class two, three up to class four. In class one, we see all the four structures, S, U, F and P, soft palate, uvula, fossils, and the pillars. In class two, the tongue is relatively larger and it blocks off the view of the pillars. Therefore, what you see is only the S, the U and the F, that is the soft palate, the uvula and the fossils. When it becomes class three, the tongue is even relatively larger in size for the oral cavity. And therefore it blocks off not only the pillars, but also the fossils. And therefore you see only the soft palate and the base of the uvula. And in class four, which is the most uh, you know, uh, complicated one, we see none of the above structures. Neither, no, you don't see the soft palate, the uvula, the fossils or the pillars. If all these are blocked, then that augurs very poorly for our ability to displace the tongue and get a view of the larynx. So just remember Malampati classification of SUFP and progressively one of the structures gets obliterated from our view. So this is now looking at the relative size of the tongue to the submandibular space. Now we want to get uh, an anatomical idea or a size evaluation of the submandibular space. We look for what is called the thyromental distance. Okay, from the thyroid cartilage to the chin, we look at the distance with the head extended and you measure the horizontal distance. Again, an approximation is three finger breaths or an actual value is a value of 6.5 centimeters, right? So you have now what is called a very quick one, two, three evaluation of the airway, one finger to be insinuated in front of the tragus as you open the mouth into the temporomandibular joint space, two fingers between the teeth or the inter incisal areas, to assess the ability to pass equipment into the oral cavity and three fingers from the chin down to the thyroid notch to assess the available space in the floor of the mouth to displace the tongue. We come to the next aspect of airway manage, uh, assessment and that is the neck movements. Now neck movements, I can just simplify by saying that we should have an extension of around 30 to 35 degrees. So you sit with the patient's mouth you know, in such a way that the the maxillary teeth are parallel to the ground. And then you ask the patient to extend the head, fix the shoulders, extend the head. The angle through which the upper teeth should move should be roughly about 30 to 35 degrees. But there are various methods of measuring this. And uh, one of them is uh, they describe that you place a pen or a pencil on the forehead and see how much distance that pen or pencil travels and use a goniometer in order to assess how many degrees of extension you have. And the second movement is flexion. If the patient can flex and touch the sternum with the chin, that means the movement is adequate. If this range of movement is not present, then you may have a problem due to neck movements in adequately positioning the patient for a, a laryngoscopy and intubation. This slide just summarizes the one, two, three rule that I talked about. And this is very important because even if you do not have time to evaluate the airway in a detailed manner during an emergency, like for example, a trauma or a cesarean section, the minimum you can do is a one, two, three test, which takes just about 15 seconds. And a lot of information can be uh, obtained from the one, two, three test and the result of this one, two, three test. Uh, this one, two, three test was taught to us when I was a postgraduate by Dr. Valerie Major, 
who was the chief of anesthesia at CMC Vellore. So some of you in the audience may have been also uh, associated with Dr. Valerie Major when she was teaching at CMC Vellore. So this is a very nice and simple rule to remember for emergency airway evaluation. Now there are some special evaluation techniques. We've not talked about what you and I can do at the bedside, but in case of doubt, we may have to go ahead and do a more detailed examination of the airway. And for this, we have the help of the radiologist and the ultrasonologist. And there are three specific evaluation techniques that have been described. The first one of them is the magnetic resonance imaging, which gives us a very, very detailed evaluation of the airway. However, the MRI images are static images. They're not dynamic images. And they give you uh, an image of a particular patient's airway at that point of time. The virtual endoscopy is something that can be done from an MRI image or from a CT scan image where you can actually using a program that is built into the radiology uh, software, you can actually rebuild the anatomy. So from uh, you know, uh, a chest CT, you can rebuild a 3D model, so to say, which you can view on your screen, which will show you the tracheobronchial tree. And you can go down the tracheobronchial tree, you can look into the tracheobronchial tree as if you're doing a virtual endoscopy. And at different points, just behind the, beyond the vocal cords, midway to the carina, at the carina, in the right vein bronchus, wherever you want, you can freeze the image and get an idea of what you can anticipate during a, an actual endoscopy. And this is called a virtual endoscopic technique. <coughs> the last uh, te special technique that is useful to us is the ultrasound technique, which is a real-time evaluation of the airway. And it gives us uh, an, ima an, an image of the airway in a dynamic fashion, in a fashion that changes with various phases of breathing, in a fashion that changes with various positions of the patient. Let's say a patient has a massive tumor sitting on the trachea. You can look at this patient's tracheal dimensions during inspiration and expiration. It's almost like doing a flow volume loop and looking at the trachea and seeing what happens to the trachea during this flow volume loop from start of inspiration till the completion of an entire respiratory cycle. You can also look at various other structures that are important like the trichothyroid membrane. Mark it if you, require, if you, if you think so, uh, if you think that you might need an emergency trichothyroidotomy. So all these uh, new techniques of radiological imaging and ultrasound have strengthened our ability to assess the airway. Now with this, armed with this, uh, you know, fairly detailed examination of the airway, we now have a rough idea as to what kind of an airway we are going to be dealing with. Sometimes we get to know that this is a, an, a known difficult airway. So we are able to prepare for it well, right? If it's a known difficult airway, we know what is the cause of the problem. Are we armed with all the equipment and personnel who are experienced to use this equipment available to deal with the situation? Are we also, uh, do we also have a standby surgeon to perform the tracheostomy in an emergency? All of this can be planned in an anticipated difficult airway. So when you look at algorithms that are available in the literature from several countries, I mean, I'm not going to go into individual algorithms. It is impossible to cover individual algorithms. But I'd like to point out to you that several algorithms are in the literature starting from about 20 or 25 years ago. And we can look at all these algorithms. Again, I draw attention to some of the algorithms that the All India Difficult Airway Association has brought out in 2016, not for any other reason, but we are talking to a majority of us are an Indian audience, and the All India Difficult Airway Association has tailored the algorithms to the requirements of the Indian audience because we know what is available in the Indian uh, practice scenario. And with that in mind, we have created some scenarios. I do agree that these scenarios are now almost uh, you know, five and a half years old. We hope to come out with new algorithms uh, probably in another year from now. So with the anatomical, physiological and contextual assessment over, let's now very quickly go into some of the points that algorithm-based airway management stresses, not necessarily an algorithm from the United States or from uh, United Kingdom or from Europe or from uh, Australasia or from India. We will just look at some of the common uh, guidelines that are available or uh, algorithms that are available. What do they point uh, a finger to? The first uh, uh, terminology that we need to understand is what is called an airway management strategy. 
the majority of algorithms actually tell us an airway plan. They don't say patient A intubate and end the algorithm there. They say patient A, this is your option A. This is your option B if option A fails. And if option A and B fail, this is option C. And they go on up to option D. So they give you various options through which you go. An algorithm just means that you ask a question to yourself about the patient. You get an answer based on that yes, no response. You take one of the branches of the algorithm till you reach a second question and so on and so forth. So an algorithm just very systematically takes you through various steps of airway management and tells you in this particular patient, what is the best airway option for you to follow? So remember I said option A, option B, option C, option D. Be always open. Your mind, your uh, team, and your equipment and operation theatre staff must be always working with patients with an open mind. So an, an airway man management strategy or plan is nothing but a series of interlinked steps that logically and seamlessly, both these terms are important. It's a logical sequence. It's a seamless sequence. It is, needs to move from one intervention to another without having to waste time. So it is a pre-rehearsed option. It's a pre-rehearsed strategy that is known to the entire team. It's not that Dr. Ramkumar is managing the case and therefore only Dr. Ramkumar should know. But in that case, nobody else will come to Dr. Ramkumar's assistance when he needs that assistance. So discuss the entire plan with your team. And that is what is called an airway management strategy. Essential equipment, skilled personnel, and a surgeon to perform tracheostomy must be available in order to go through a pre-planned uh, interlinked airway management strategy in a safe and secure manner. Remember that if you do not do this, you know, a failed airway is often due to failure to plan for failure. All of us are very experienced. Some of us think that, oh, I have 35 years of experience under my belt. I can never go wrong. And uh, the reason for that is just a three letter word. And that is spelled as E, G and O. That is ego. And none of us should have any ego, especially when it concerns a patient's airway on which the patient is dependent for his or her life. So always be prepared for failure. If you do not plan for failure, you might result in failure, and that will result in a failed airway. Uh, uh, you know, uh, a defense colleague of mine once used to say that the more we sweat in peace, the less we bleed in war. And that's another nice way to look at it. The more we sweat in peace, the more we plan and plan. You may take two hours to plan an airway management, and it will be over in two minutes. Okay. However, if you plan for an airway management in two minutes, you may struggle for the next two hours to successfully manage the case. So I think ideal time management, ideal strategy management is very important, which is why I put this slide first. We're about 30 minutes into our lecture, and uh, the time now is 10.30. I am definite I'll be able to finish on time, and I'll leave some time for questions. The next aspect that all, uh, what should I say, algorithm-based airway management strategies talk about is positioning. Now, we need to essentially look at what uh, you know, was described uh, in 1930, as I mentioned earlier by McGill, the pillow was very much part of the positioning. A head elevation of around 8 to 10 centimeters is essential. Most of us use a head ring to elevate the head of the patient to an uh, elevation of about 8 to 10 centimeters, such above the point of the, uh, above the level of the shoulder. So the shoulder is resting on the table. The head should be about 8 to 10 centimeters above the level of the shoulder. This is the typical position in which we start our airway management. Now, there are certain other special airway, airway position, I mean, uh, head positioning techniques that are described. The second bullet point draws our attention to what's called the RAMP position, which stands for Rapid Airway Management Positioner, which I will show you in the subsequent slide. There is a special positioning required for obstetric patients, even if they are non-obese, keeping the gravid uterus in mind. And there is a special positioning required for pediatric patients. So positioning of the head is very important for every airway management. And it differs slightly, or maybe in a major way, while dealing with an obese patient, while dealing with an obstetric patient, and while dealing with a pediatric patient. And given for you at the, at the bottom of the slide are two of the guidelines, again, that we brought out. 
and specifically look at airway management in obstetrics and airway management in pediatrics. Right. Now, this slide kind of gives us an overall overview of the positioning of patients in various subgroups. To the left, you have a, a diagram with two panels, A and B. This is an obese individual that is positioned only on a pillow, which is elevating the head by about 8 to 10 centimeters. It's obviously not enough, but because the objective of positioning, proper positioning of the head in airway management is to get this line that you see here. The line that connects the external auditory meatus to the sternum notch should be horizontal to the floor or the table top. And that has been achieved in this obese patient by what is called a ramping position. It may be a single device called a troop elevation pillow. It could be multiple blankets that are available in plenty in the operation theater. But essentially, position your patient head in such a way that when looking at your patient's head in a profile view, means from the side, you will notice that the external auditory meatus is at the same line as the sternal notch. And this will give you the best possible shot at airway management. Coming to the lower right diagram, you have somebody, this is an obstetric patient, and here an assistant is displacing the gravid uterus to the left side, taking the gravid uterus off the uh, inferior vena cava and avoiding what is called the aortocable syndrome. The head of the patient, we are not shown here in this, in this particular picture, but the head and neck, there's nothing different in an obstetric patient, unless they are also obese, in which case you will use this left uterine displacement along with the ramp movement. Now, let's look at a little more detail about this positioning of children. Starting with an infant, we know that the infant's head is relatively large, and that is from intrauterine life. The large head actually needs us to elevate the shoulder of the patient. So very often when we are managing children, usually under the age of, let's say, one and a half to two years of age, we usually use what's called a shoulder roll or a, a, a thin pillow in order to make sure that this side profile is obtained for you to intubate the infant. Notice that there is nothing under the occiput of the child. When the child grows a little bit beyond the age of two years, up to, let's say, 12 years of age, or up to about eight years of age, I'm sorry, I correct myself, two to eight years of age, you can have nothing under the shoulder or the head of the patient. The relative sizes of the shoulder, of the chest, and the head are now grown in such a way that you get optimal positioning of the head with no pillow and no, no pillow either under the head or under the shoulder. Eventually, as a child grows older into adulthood, you will need to use the classical pillow under the head, as I described earlier. Right, so this is a bit about special positioning that we need to look at after looking at the algorithm that tells us the stepwise approach to airway management. We need to spend a, a little bit of time on oxygenation because we know that oxygen sustains life, right? And the first thing that even an intern posted to anesthesia has taught is how to pre-oxygenate the patient coming up for a general anesthetic. So early on in our anesthetic career, we are taught how to pre-oxygenate our patients. And what does pre-oxygenation do? Pre-oxygenation, which is administration of oxygen prior to the induction of anesthesia, replaces all the nitrogen in our functional residual capacity in such a way that an average of 2 to 2.5 liters of functional residual capacity is now filled completely with oxygen. What was it filled with earlier? It was filled with 2.5 liters of air which had only 20% oxygen, which means about, if you take 2.5 liters as the functional residual capacity, at the start of pre-oxygenation, we have only 500 ml of oxygen inside the lungs. But if you adequately pre-oxygenate your patient, I'm not gonna go into the technique, adequate pre-oxygenation can be three minutes to five minutes of normal tidal volume breathing, or it could be a vital capacity breath, Four to eight vital capacity breaths can be done. We can do one minute of vital capacity breaths. Several things have been described in literature, but the end point of pre-oxygenation is to look at what is called a fraction of end tidal oxygen. Many of us are fortunate to nowadays work with machines, anesthesia workstations that actually show us the inspired oxygen and the end tidal oxygen. So what it means is that the end tidal gas coming out of the patient's lungs at the end of breathing, at the end of the tidal volume breath, 
If that is having more than 90% oxygen, we can say that pre-oxygenation is adequate, right? Now, we also, most algorithms also emphasize the fact that you must continuously oxygenate. When I was a postgraduate, we were taught that pre-oxygenation is important. And if you fail to achieve a definitive airway at, at your first attempt, you need to reapply the mask and re-oxygenate your patient, which is what the third bullet point says. Re-oxygenate your patient between attempts at intubation or supraglottic airway insertion. So now you're in the process of achieving a definitive airway. At any point, you find that you're not able to do that in your first or your second attempt, and you're looking at your monitor. We'll come to that a little later. And your monitor says that the saturation is dropping below 95%. It is time that you think of re-oxygenating your patient. So the first step is pre-oxygenation. All of us do it for a general anesthetic. The second step is re-oxygenation between attempts. And what most algorithms have now come out with is what is called continuous oxygenation, which is nothing but administering oxygen at a rate of 10 to 15 liters per minute through binasal prongs. You can apply a binasal prongs, take it over comfortably over the years of the patient. And even when you start pre-oxygenation, you can have 10 to 15 liters of oxygen flowing in through the nasal passages into the oropharynx and laryngopharynx and nasopharynx. What it is doing is, we know from our knowledge of oxygen therapy, that it fills up the reservoir of the nasopharynx, the oropharynx, the laryngopharynx, and whatever is available in the oral cavity. All the air in this area is displaced and filled with 100% oxygen. If you administer 10 to 15 liters of oxygen per minute during continuous oxygenation technique. The majority of anesthesia workstations also have an auxiliary flow for oxygen. So you have, have an auxiliary, auxiliary flow meter for oxygen. You can connect your nasal prong to this and the main oxygen supply, which comes through the flow meter bank, can be applied through your uh, breathing circuit to the face of the patient. So oxygenation is extremely important. And very often people talking about the importance of oxygenation say that there are three points that are important, oxygen, Oxygen and oxygen. Do not fail to oxygenate your patient. Do not miss an opportunity to oxygenate your patient. The other thing that's come out now in the markets in the last maybe six, seven years is uh, Dr. Anil Patel's and Nure's uh, device, which is called Thry. Some of us may be very fortunate to have this in the operation theater or in the intensive care unit. What this device basically does is with tight fitting nasal prongs, it goes one step beyond the administration of continuous nasal oxygen that we talked about in the previous slide. It's not 10 to 15 liters of oxygen. It is anywhere between 50, 50 to 70 liters of oxygen per minute, and it is humidified. And therefore, it's called transnasal humidified rapid insufflation ventilatory exchange. And please, all of us must read this paper. It's extremely important. I've come to almost the last five minutes of my lecture. Remember that you can administer oxygen as much as you want. Hyperoxia will not kill in a short-term uh, uh, short term administration of oxygen. If you administer 100% oxygen for days together, like in the ICU, you can, I agree, get pulmonary oxygen toxicity. But oxygen given at 100% level for short periods of time during airway management will not kill. But the bottom line is important. Hypoxia will surely kill. Please remember that while hyperoxia will not kill, hypo hypoxia surely will. And that's what we are trying to avoid by oxygenation, reoxygenation, and continuous oxygenation. How do we know that we have oxygenated our patients adequately? Now, there are two equipment. Monitoring has, very, has made anesthesia very safe in the last 25 years or so. And the two equipment that I would place my money on that has made anesthesia safe is what is shown in the two panels at the bottom, the pulse oximeter and the entitled carbon dioxide monitor. Obviously, one tells about oxygenation and the other tells about the carbon dioxide elimination. It also tells us most importantly that if a carbon dioxide waveform is seen, if a capnograph waveform is seen, the device is properly placed. It could be a supraglottic airway device, it could be an endotracheal tube. And the pulse oximeter value on the left that you see, remember that 95% is the number we are looking for, drops below 95, raise an alarm. Now call for help as early as possible. Press the panic button early rather than late. Also, when you have an anticipated difficult airway, it's preferable to have a colleague 
either informed tell the person i know you are available two operation theaters away in an operation theater complex i am starting such and such a case and i would like to examine this case with you if i land in trouble i will call you and this is what i plan to do this is what you call by an algorithmic step wise approach to a difficult airway so you preferable to have an experienced colleague with you inform him or her of all the steps that you have thought about and maybe even stand by he or she is free depending on the gravity of the situation it is as i say in the last bullet point better to have a bruised ego than create an airway related morbidity or mortality that will haunt you for life uh, fortunately i have not lost a patient in my long career during airway management but i have lost a patient post operatively when i was doing my post graduation as a senior resident after post graduation in jipper had one obstetric death and that death still haunts me believe me or not even to this day i sometimes wake up in a sweat thinking about that particular patient so death is a very difficult uh, you know thing to get over especially if you have been the cause of death so be very careful pack up your ego call for help early extubation strategy i just like to say that when one is faced with a difficult intubation plan for a safe extubation and we have one algorithm designed in the all india difficult airway association which looks at just how you extubate your patient a pearl of wisdom from this particular uh, article would be that intubation may be performed with diligence if you are well trained you have done you know hundreds of intubations over the last 20 years you may manage to intubate even a difficult airway but extubation needs intelligence do not extubate a patient who has been difficult to intubate unless you are sure that you will be able to manage you know the patient's airway post extubation now in summary uh, in the last 45 minutes or so what i have been talking about is two aspects in my lecture the first aspect was how do we or what do we assess when we perform an airway assessment and i said that we look at three components of airway assessment we look for anatomically difficult flags red flags that tell us that this patient airway may be difficult to access because of anatomical difficulties we look for a physiological problem that may be coexisting in this patient that will only add to the woes of the patient and the airway manager like you and me we finally look at a contextual element which means this patient is ideally intubated with a fiber optic uh, you know uh, bronchoscope i do not have one or i have one but i do not have the expertise to use it it is a contextual red flag that tells you in the airway assessment that the airway management can be difficult bullet point number 2 we went through the difficulties in five possible steps of airway management i obviously don't have time to go through all of them but i said that we look for factors in the uh, in our airway assessment that tell us that we may have a difficulty in face mask ventilation we may have a difficulty in intubation using direct laryngoscopy or video laryngoscopy we may have a problem in placing a supraglottic airway we may have a problem in an emergency cricothyrotomy and each of these steps is to oxygenate my patient and each of these steps have very unique anatomical features that will make the airway management difficult so look for all of this in your airway assessment the clinical examination we divided into sniffing position mouth opening the relative size of tongue in the mandible and the neck movements these are all the various sub parts of airway assessment that we look for i also very briefly said that in the current day airway assessment in the current day practice of anesthesia we need to look at special assessment techniques such as the magnetic resonance imaging or ct scanning virtual endoscopy and ultrasonography in assessing static and dynamic assessment of the airway as far as the algorithmic based management of the airway was concerned i divided my second half of the lecture into six parts i said said that we need to have an airway management strategy or plan which runs from option a to b to c to d which will differ from patient to patient from context to context from individual to individual and this plan needs to be discussed thread bare with the entire team that is going to manage the patient positioning is important for if you do not position your patient properly you can only blame yourself later for not achieving the airway in as quick a manner as possible i underscored the importance of oxygenation by using three terms pre oxygenation continuous oxygenation and deoxygenation i said press the alarm button press the panic button to call for the airway to call for the um, help i'm sorry call for help as as uh, early as possible don't be late because you may 
uh, land up with a problem. I said, as far as monitoring con is concerned, constantly look at your pulse oximeter and capnograph to tell you clues as to when you're going wrong and always have a plan for extubation. With this, I thank uh, the online anesthesia group for this invitation. I enjoyed speaking to you over the last 47 minutes on airway assessment and the algorithmic approach to airway management. I specifically thank Dr. Edward Johnson for this invitation, Dr. Rajesh for constantly keeping in touch with me, uh, making sure that I uh, am uh, you know, in line, on target for this lecture today. And also Dr. Gomati, Dr. Shantini, Dr. Shuprasad, and Dr. Sandhya for giving me this wonderful opportunity to be part of the online anesthesia initiative. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir, for a wonderful tailor-made lecture for the postgraduates. Thank you. You know your capability, you can talk to the consultant, uh, any level you can talk, but you made it as a tailor-made for the postgraduate. That is great, sir. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. Actually, we are waiting to hear more from you, sir, but with that time being, the time is restricted. Uh, we are cut to 45 minutes. There are yes. some questions I will ask. Yes, sir. Yes, One yes. question from Dr. Lavanya. In case of difficult airway, what are the different forms of NIV methods available? Okay. Uh, you can see if it's a child, you can use a, a tight fitting nasal prongs. That also gives NIV. In an older patient, a nasal mask or an oro nasal mask is perfectly okay. This is what is described in the uh, paper that I talked about, the All India Difficult Labor Association paper on ICU management. It talks about non-invasive ventilation with a mask. It could be nasal mask or a oro nasal mask. <clears throat> a nasal mask obviously will give us a little more flexibility because we can then perform a procedure through the mouth. However, once you open the mouth, the tight-fitting, uh, you know, non-invasive ventilation may lose its, uh, its uh, what should I say, efficacy. Having said that, these are the ways you can manage with non-invasive ventilation. And I think you can just use whatever the patient was on until that point of time. If it's a fresh case, it's an anesthetic induction and you want to use non-invasive ventilation. A tight-fitting mask with the adjustable pressure limiting valve completely closed is also good enough. That also applies enough uh, pressure within the airways. I hope Dr. Lavanya was happy Thank with that. Yes. Otherwise, uh, please put up a subject, subsidiary question. I'll try yeah. and answer it better. So, Dr. Gayatri, so yes. what is the normal neck circumference? How to measure it? It's a postgraduate question. Okay. See, generally, you know, literature talks about 39 centimeters being a cutoff, uh, 39 centimeters of neck circumference. Uh, essentially, we have gone beyond that now. Now, even a patient with a thinner neck, we need to evaluate actually the, the fat that is there in front of the trachea. And uh, that is what usually causes the problem. An obese patient, of course, we're looking at one parameter, that is the neck circumference, but along with this, several other tissues in the neck are also filled with fat. And that is what causes a problem. You can imagine fat sitting in a submandibular region can pose a problem to displacement of the tongue. Fat in the, uh, the base of the neck and the uh, hump of the shoulder can cause a problem in positioning of your patient, the buffalo hump kind of situation. So fat anywhere around the head and neck region, including the upper torso, can be a problem in various ways to the uh, to our securing a difficult uh, 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 secure airway. So, uh, is Dr. Gayatri uh, happy Thank with the answer? That's fine. Yeah. Otherwise, yeah. please pose a subsidiary question. I won't okay. say that again. So from uh, Dr. Saman, that is uh, during ramping in OT, is it useful for uh, video lenses to be as well, sir? Is it ramping? The ramping, will it help in the video laryngoscopy also? Oh, yes, definitely. Any, definitely. Anything, see, ramping is being done for uh, getting, uh, you know, your upper airway in the most optimal position. As was mentioned in those two slides on direct laryngoscopy and video laryngoscopy, you do need to pass the instrument through the mouth. It's only that you're getting an indirect view of the larynx, not a direct view. That's the only difference. So, ramping also is important for when you're planning a video laryngoscopy. Yes, definitely. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Another question, what is the difference between modified malampati and uh, original malampati? And original, okay. The original malampati had only three classes. Had only three classes. And uh, it was modified by Samson and Young to add on a fourth class. Uh, so that, that's it. So original malampati described only three. Yes. 
So they went and uh, um, for your information, there's also a modified Malampati class zero. If somebody can answer that on the chat, I'll be really happy. But I seem to have lost my chat. I don't know. It's because of... It, 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 we have uh, limited... No problem. no problem. So if uh, somebody can answer it, like a, you know, it shouldn't be a one-way discourse. If anybody can answer what is uh, grade zero. Can see the jugula, huh? Seeing the... No, not, not uvula. See, seeing the uvula, I mean... We don't see the none of those structures as we talked about earlier it become grade four already, right? So when you say uvula, it is the small little what they call ulnak in Tamil, right? So what I what do you see? Something else right. you don't expect to see. You open the book. Epic lotus. Epic lotus. That's right. Epic lotus. And this was described by a person called E Z R I Ezri Ezri's modification. It is a class zero, and I have had a few people in my department. Uh, you know, uh, who were my postgraduates initially, then became went on to become staff, in whom I was able to demonstrate this to whoever wanted to see it. They open the mouth, you see the epiglottis. Then you think it's going to be extremely difficult, to, I mean, extremely easy to intubate, but don't be misled. Grade zero can also cause problems. Just remember that. Okay. 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 Sir. Not that you'll see the larynx very easily, just because you're seeing the epiglottis. Okay. Sir, another question from Dr. Rishi Kumar. What yes, is the difference between thrive and HFNC? HFNC. Between thrive and HFNC. HFNC. High, flow so high flow nasal cannula. They are essentially the same. Thrive is actually a name given by the perpetrators of this technique. Dr. Anil Patel and Dr. Nure, when they described this, you know, Dr. Anil Patel is an anesthetist working in an ENT setup. And his uh, co author, Dr. Nure, they described it, they called this equipment Thrive. THRIV, it's just one of the techniques. There are many, OptiFlow is one of the things that's available in the market. There are many techniques that use the same principle. High flow humidified oxygen administered through a relatively tight fitting nasal prongs can be called high flow nasal cannula. It's the same thing. It's the same thing. There are different companies making it. They call it by a different name. Thrive is a generic, is a name given by the authors, original authors. Okay. So from Dr. Lias. So, how to proceed with the edentulous patients? Edentulous. Excellent question. I, in fact, I wanted to say this while I was speaking. You know, generally, we, we think that edentulous patient, you don't want to knock the dentures into the oral cavity and disappear into the trachea during the process of intubation. But I would say, if the patient has a full set of dentures, up, upper and lower denture, ask them to bring it to the operation theater. Keep the dentures on during face mask ventilation. And remember to take it off during the act of laryngoscopy and intubation. The presence of both the dentures gives you the proper facial contour for you to apply a proper fitting mask. Excellent question. Thank you for that. I missed this point while I was presenting. Okay, sir. Sir, is there a retrograde intubation has any role in the modern uh, algorithm, airway algorithm? Absolutely. It's coming back. In fact, now I've seen a couple of papers recently where they're talking about retrograde intubation, you know, um, uh, using, uh, what should I say, uh, you know, a video laryngoscope, right? So now remember when retrograde uh, intubation was described, uh, you know, it was an archaic technique. We thought it's a barbaric technique in those days because we didn't have a fiber optic bronchoscope. We didn't have a video laryngoscope. We didn't have supraglottic airways. And imagine the three major arms of airway management were not there. We had to intubate with a direct laryngoscope. If we failed, only God could help the patient and us. Right? So in those situations, we used to go for a retrograde intubation, provided we could continue oxygenating the patient. It's definitely coming back in a big way. right? And uh, uh, you know, I, I think it's not yet out of the arm tail. It is definitely there. Thank you, thank you, sir. The last In fact, it should be practiced, I think. Okay. Uh, depending on, you know, if you have not on guinea pigs, okay, not on uh, animals, when you have a patient who will benefit from a, a you know, a retrograde intubation and you have a fiber optic laryngoscope, if the patient permits, which is very unlikely, you can go ahead and do it. Yes, last question, please. Last question, sir. Sir, in your opinion, whether the conventional laryngoscope is going to go out of the Anesthesia practice in future after the introduction of laryng video laryngoscope. laryngoscope. <clears throat> well, uh, see, I am an old school thought. Okay. Uh, I, I have now a retired professor of anesthesiology, and uh, uh, to me, also, video laryngoscope is new. So, along 
the last uh, last 10 or 12 years when i have been actually using the video laryngoscope i think it will eventually replace eventually depending for us the limiting factor in india is the cost so i think in many situation we will still have to keep that as the primary reason why we cannot hope to go for a video laryngoscope as our first choice but once the prices come down and uh, you know the depart the administration becomes a little more understanding i think video laryngoscope i am afraid to predict maybe the next 10 years or so i think direct laryngoscope may take a back shift you know a back burner to av management thank you sir the last question was mine okay <laughs> okay thank you i don't have a once again thank you very much i think we finished in time 58 minutes yes, that sir. leaves to 2 minutes uh, 10 15 minutes of the point there are so many questions i'm not able to see all of you for some reason i'm not uh, there i can only okay. see myself you know and oh yeah maybe i'm with the wrong view okay, okay. Okay. Thanks. Uh, Thank you so uh, much. Dr. Nandan, Dr. Ajay, and whoever else is on the meeting. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Have a great day. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. So Thank, much. you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you sir. So with that uh, we come to the end of this session. I thank the Anastasia TV, uh, Athurala and Evangel Logics for the support you. And next week we will meet with the uh, Yarway uh, gadgets. It's in a workshop type uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you sir. I'll go off, uh, Dr. Johnson. Okay, sir. Thank you.